Let me first uh, welcome you all at our kickoff uh, seminar of uh, the distinguished seminar series we have been inaugurating. It gives me a distinct pleasure that uh, Dr. Marian Wolf is the one who kicks off uh, our series. So a very warm welcome to Marian. Marian, she's a geophysicist uh, by education. She did her undergraduate studies at the Hope University College before moving at Caltech, where she did her PhD in uh, and master and PhD degrees in geophysics. And uh, she said she has had a very distinguished career over the years. Um, and she has been named one of the top 100 women in energy by the National Diversity Council in 2021. She has been with as the vice president at Sadia National Laboratories, leading the energy and climate programs now, <clears throat> programs there. And uh, she's now the chief research officer and de uh, deputy director of uh, the Idaho uh, National Lab, leading again the, inter the integration between science, <coughs> technology, and the policy for energy. So she, she has been uh, a member of uh, many uh, societies, including everything on the geophysical and uh, energy spaces, women in nuclear, American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Nuclear Society, Association for Women Geoscientists, the Seismological Society of America, and many others. And she has been also a member, we're very proud to have Marian as a member of our external advisory board. So a very warm welcome to Dr. Wolf, who is going to give us an overview of how nuclear energy can be integrated with the mix to address future needs of energy in society. Marian. Very happy to be here at Texas A&M in person to uh, deliver what I hope will be an interesting overview of what we're doing at Idaho National Laboratory in nuclear energy and also in integrated energy systems to try to help us get to our low carbon energy future that we need from this nation. So of course, we know that we expect that the world will be using much more energy in the next decade, and we're going to be getting warmer. As you know, the IPCC just came out with a new report this last month with updated uh, predictions of energy, and it's not looking good. We have uh, our current state here with the circle and several different potential paths, most of which exceed the Paris Agreement targets in fairly short order. So that would seem to indicate that it would be a good idea for us to be looking at ways to reduce our emissions to sequester carbon, of course, which we are already doing, and how, what kind of energy future do we want to have for the nation? Well, let's look at our uh, emissions to get started. Probably most of you are familiar with this type of a chart called the Sankey diagram. These are put out by Lawrence Livermore periodically. They're on their website if you want to take a, if you haven't studied them and you're interested in doing so. But this diagram shows our carbon emissions in the US, this is just the US, this is what we can control, right? Split between electricity generation, this is a big chunk, but not all of it by any means, quite a bit in transportation. And then the rest, still a pretty good chunk in industrial, commercial, and residential. And so we have a variety of carbon emitting sources. Natural gas contributes to all three sectors. Coal contributing primarily to electricity generation and petroleum primarily to transportation. But this just illustrates again that electrification is, if we can get our carbon uh, emissions down from electrification, that's great but it doesn't address all of our problems. We still need to address both the transportation sector and also our industrial, commercial, and residential sectors. And in our transportation sector, the light duty uh, percentage of that is only about 35%. So we still have a lot of work to do in order to be able to uh, 
reduce our carbon emissions uh, for in all these sectors and make a difference. But if you look at the energy consumption in the same type of chart, this is where our renewables come in. This is where nuclear comes in. Nuclear provides 20% of the nation's electricity, as you know, from a slightly under 100 uh, large power plants. And, and at its maximum, I think there were 104. Now they're in the mid 90s because several have closed due, due to economic considerations. But still producing about 20% of the nation's electricity consumption and about 55% of the nation's carbon free energy. So our energy sector is very complicated in that we have various types of renewables nuclear, hydro, wind, geothermal and natural gas and coal all contribute to our electricity sector. But then when we get down to uh, transportation, of course, it's almost entirely petroleum and then natural gas contributes across the board. So this is just a, an illustration of how complex it is to change our, and you're all aware of this, but how complex it is to change our energy future. So what we need to do is figure out how we can uh, create a new system that will uh, be able to provide energy for electricity, for transportation, and for industrial in a carbon-free way. And we need to do it pretty fast if we're going to be able to uh, affect our emissions in the next few decades. So in the U.S. National Laboratories, we are trying very hard to work on technologies to do just that. And I thought I'd spend a few minutes describing the national laboratory system for you so that you can get a feel for what we're about. There are 17 U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories across the country. You can see from the slide where they're located, and they are in several categories. They range in size from just a few hundred. Ames Laboratory in Ames, Iowa is about 500 people, I believe, up to 13 or 14,000, uh, which are the largest two laboratories are Sandia, which is located in Albuquerque and also in Livermore, California, and then Los Alamos, also located in New Mexico. Those are the two largest laboratories. And these laboratories cover a spectrum of research and development. There are 10 that are managed by the DOE Office of Science, which is a $7 billion function within the uh, Department of Energy. And they are either single program labs, which are the smaller ones, you see here, Fermi Lab, Jefferson Lab, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which is all about magnetic fusion, for example. Those are single program laboratories. And then we have multi purpose science laboratories such as Oak Ridge, Brookhaven, Berkeley, <coughs> Argonne, Pacific Northwest, which are large organizations that do a wide variety of science, and many of them have flagship computing enterprises and also light sources, photon sources, neutron sources, which they use for a variety of scientific investigations, but they also do applied energy work at these laboratories. Then we have our multi-purpose security laboratories, Lawrence Livermore, Sandia, and Los Alamos. And these are national nuclear security laboratories. They are focused on national security in our nuclear weapons complex, but they also do a wide variety of energy research and science at those laboratories. And finally, we have our energy technology laboratories. There are three of them, NREL, which focuses on renewables, INL, which is the nation's nuclear energy laboratory, and NETL, which is associated with our fossil energy and carbon management part of the Department of Energy. So, um, and that, that's where we're working, of course, on uh, carbon sequestration and CCUS utilization and sequestration of carbon. Savannah River is the final laboratory and it's a multi-purpose environmental laboratory located in Aiken, South Carolina. So we have a wide variety of different types of laboratories. And I will say that the applied energy laboratories focus on applied research and engineering. INL is primarily an engineering laboratory. And, but they work, we try to work, very, we try very hard to work together as a system to tackle these really difficult problems for the nation. So that's just a little bit about the uh, DOE National Laboratory System. And now I will focus in on Idaho National Laboratory itself. So our vision is to change the world's energy future and while securing its critical infrastructure. And of course, we have a mission to, to do this through technology. And these photographs on this slide simply show some of the realities that we're facing today with regards to wildfires, hurricanes, infrastructure disruptions that are occurring due to our current situation and why we need to change our world's energy future. So we address 
in these, um, these problems at scale at Idaho National Laboratory. So this little map here on the left, I know you can't read any of the writing on that, but that's the shape of the INL site, which is 890 square miles. So it's almost as large as the state of Rhode Island. The research and educa education campus, which is on the little dot off to the right, that's where I work, is in Idaho Falls, Idaho, in eastern Idaho. INL is actually sort of shaped like the state of Idaho in reverse, so it's a little bit confusing. But we have many facilities across INL that where we can perform nuclear and other types of demonstrations at scale. Idaho's history is that it was formed in 1949 as the National Reactor Test Station. And over the years, there have been 52 different nuclear reactors, all test reactors, built at the Idaho National Laboratory site. Now, right now, we have four of those are continue to operate. The largest of those is the Advanced Test Reactor, which has its own complex in which about 500 people work. It's a 250 megawatt thermal test reactor with a very unique design. The primary mission of it is to support the nuclear Navy. As you know, our reactors and our submarines are, are powered by nuclear, but it does a wide variety of other different types of scientific and engineering activities as well. Uh, we have actually have two reactors at ATR, and then we have uh, two out of the materials and fuels complex, which is on that blue dot there, uh, one of which does transient uh, experiments. It's called TREAT. It uh, simulates, can simulate accidents in light water reactors. And then also we have a neutron radiography imaging reactor called NRAD. So we have four operating reactors. We also have a variety of other different types of full-scale test ranges. So this is one of the, th the things that makes INL particularly unique is the ability to do things at full scale. But we also do things at you know, theoretical, computational, laboratory scale as well. But it's this full spectrum, which we and particularly focused on nuclear, which we believe makes us uh, unique. So let's talk a little bit more about how, what we do at INL. We have three directorates that are focused on nuclear. I talked about a little bit about the advanced test reactor complex. The, uh, that's a photo there of the core of the advanced test reactor, which is really odd. It's different. It's unique. It is serpentine and it has beryllium reflectors and uh, allows variations of radiation while, while the thing is, whole thing is running, you can have different parts of the core that have different power levels, which allows you great flexibility in terms of what you are irradiating. It provides thermal spectrum steady state of radiation capabilities. We also have the materials and fuels complex where we do a lot of post irradiation examination work. You can see a picture of a hot cell there. We have a really very large set of hot cells in the materials and fuels complex. And we also have a large irradiation radiant materials laboratory where we're doing bound to atomistic level imaging of, of irradiated materials. After they come out of the reactors, we can uh, put them in shielded cells and uh, TEMs, SCMs, atom probes, those types of things to uh, really look uh, a great deal of detail in those materials. Uh, we also have a nuclear science and technology organization where we're doing a lot of the reactor design, uh, efficiency types of work, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And then we have two other directorates, one of which is focused on non-nuclear energy and environment science and technology, things like wind, solar, biomass, um, a little bit of geothermal, those types of things, and the electric grid integration. And then we have a whole group of people who do national and homeland security science and technology. And that includes non-proliferation types of work, as well as some uh, hardcore defense things and critical infrastructure analysis, which I will address a little bit later as well. So with regards to what we're trying to do in our laboratory, it's all about the low carbon energy future. And we have five different strategic initiatives. And I'm going to structure the talk around these strategic initiatives. The three that form the triangle are the three uh, that are important for nuclear and integrated energy systems. So we have two uh, 
uh, initiatives that are around nuclear. One's around reactors, both sustained uh, operation of our current fleet and new reactors, expanded deployment, new reactor technologies. We also have one on the integrated fuel cycle. Then we use those to support our integrated energy systems initiative that I'll talk about where we're trying to take everything, put it together in a new way. And I think you here in the Energy Institute are very much in tune with this, the need for these uh, types of new systems. So I'll talk a little bit about that. These are supported by two other initiatives, one on advanced materials and manufacturing in extreme environments. And the other is to make the entire uh, system secure and resilient cyber security, but also physical security. So that's what INL does in a nutshell. So let's talk about the different uh, things that we are doing. So with regards to our reactor sustainment and deployment initiative, we are looking at three different aspects to strengthen the current domestic commercial enterprise, to enable our leadership here in the US and globally, and then finally, to support that by, by expanding and deploying our strategic infrastructures. And I don't know how many of you have uh, been listening or have had the opportunity to <coughs> listen to some of the things that our new Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, has said uh, in her various uh, discussions publicly. But here she says, let me say it loud and clear, carbon-free nuclear power is an absolutely critical part of our decarbonization equation. I think there is bipartisan support for including nuclear as we move forward into the new energy systems. So let's talk a little bit about what we are doing with regards to the in nuclear. So we are working on different concepts for light water reactors that can help us be, help them stay more economical. So as you know, the reason that some of these nuclear plants have been closed is because they are no longer considered to be economically competitive. They have, are incredibly uh, reliable. They have very high capacity factors, well over 90% of the time that the plant could be operating, it is operating fleet-wide, but yet, the, uh, the way the markets are structured in some places, some of the new large nuclear plants are no longer economically sustainable. So what can we do to help that? We are looking at different uh, potential different fuels where you can do higher burn-ups so to reduce costs that way. Other ways to reduce costs include more automation. So we're using artificial intelligence machine learning to try to understand how can we uh, reduce the need for particular inspections. How can we do inspections better? What kind of sensors can we put into the plants? Those types of things. Uh, and and how, uh, how the workforce, honestly, can become made more economical so that we can keep those plants open, producing that 20% of the nation's electricity that we need. We're also working very hard on these accident-tolerant fuel concepts which are part of the equation in terms of uh, keeping the current fleet open. One of the, the fuels that we've been working on for a number of years is called Triso. These are little teeny pebbles. If you hadn't seen them before, they're really small. You can get a whole bunch of them into a little, a little cup. Each one of them has some nuclear fuel inside of it, surrounded by ceramic, and that is a very, very safe fuel. And so we're talking about uh, you know, creating uh, even safer ways of, of doing nuclear in the future. And so those are, and in all these areas, we're working with different industrial entities, as you can see listed on the slide. And this is all funded by the Department of Energy Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program. So INL is doing a whole lot of things aimed at keeping the current fleet viable and economical. We're also doing things reaching out to the new future for nuclear, which many believe involves very small reactors. One of the issues with large reactors, of course, is the incredible amount of capital investment that you have to make in order to, to build one. And if any of you have been watching the new build at Volatile, Georgia, you, you have seen some of the issues that they've encountered in terms of cost overruns and uh, schedule delays. And so, if we can make it more simple to create nuclear energy and more flexible for the new integrated energy system, that would be a plus. 
So we're working on small reactors, and I will get into even more of that in a, in a little bit. But one of the initiatives that we're working on at INL is called a fission battery, which is not even just, it's even smaller than what many people refer to as micro reactors. The idea being that it would be standardized and you would build it somewhere else, bring it in, you could run it unattended, you could install it, and away it goes, just like a battery. This is certainly in the early stages, but it's one of the initiatives we're working on in our nuclear science and technology directorate. Other things we're doing is working on new materials. So we have another initiative on nuclear material qualification. That's another, the, one of the big um, obstacles to doing new nuclear is qualifying the fuel. And it takes typically these days 20 years to qualify a new nuclear fuel. So how can we do this faster? Uh, what are the, and we now have better tools where we can do more with in situ sensing when, when things are inside the reactor. In the old days, it's cook and look, I think is what they used to call it, right? You put it into the reactor and then you take it out and look at it. That's the post radiation examination. If we can speed up that process, then we can speed up the qualification of materials so we understand how they work, they work after they're irradiated. And then we can move along the speed up the cycle to doing new nuclear. We're using digital engineering. Digital twins of new nuclear plants is a, is a big focus for us at INL and using all the different types of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, algorithms and methods that are out there in order to enable and spur the, uh, spur the development of new nuclear technologies in a way that is uh, more quick and time effective. And then finally, on this slide, we see the GAIN initiative, which is the gateway for acceleration in new nuclear. And this is a national laboratory program run out of IML, but includes other uh, national laboratories as well, in which we are, we provide vouchers to industrial partners to work with the national laboratory scientists and engineers to help solve some of their new problems. There are a large number of small startups and some fairly large startups in new nuclear technologies, but there are issues that they need to be able to address. They can do that through GAIN by working uh, with the national laboratories. The national laboratories are funded by the government and these vouchers provide that ability for the industry to, industry to work with them. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about our timeline at INL for demonstrating advanced reactors. We think it's extremely important that we can get out there and get some new, small new reactors operational. And this is a really busy slide. It's a brand new one. And it shows from about 2022 up to 2030, some of the different projects that we have going on that INL is involved with. And you can see that our, there are many. I'll start by talking about our National Reactor Innovation Center, which is a DOE program. Again, it's a national program, involves several labs, but it's run out of INL. And NREC is designed to help get new reactor concepts demonstrated. And we have two test sites that we are developing at INL. One is the dome test bed, which you can see is a dome. That's actually uh, for those of you who may be familiar with nuclear, that's the old EBR2, Experimental Breeder Reactor 2 dome. It's at the Materials and Fuels Complex. It was scheduled, the reactor, of course, is no longer in there. It was scheduled for demolition, and we saved it, and now we are uh, going to be using it for demonstrating uh, reactor technologies that are about less than 10 megawatts thermal, I believe, and use fuel that's less than 20% rich uranium. And then this is what we're calling the Lotus test bed, which is the old zipper cell. For any of you who may be familiar with INL's um, facility, zipper stands for zero power physics reactor. Again, there's no reactor in there anymore, but it's in the high security areas. This is an area where we can use fuels that have plutonium in them or it may otherwise pose, it's now a security issue. And it's also, but, but it is a smaller facility, so it has to be a, a lower power test. So we've got a couple of, of test areas that we are working on. And what are we going to put in there? Well, 
The first thing we're doing is we're developing, and I have a couple slides on this separately, so I won't say <laughs> much about it here, a very small, I believe 200 kilowatt thermal, um, yeah, I believe that's correct, test, it'll, it'll be on the slide, so we'll check me in a minute, uh, reactor called Marvel, which we are doing on our own at INL, funded by DOE, with the idea that we need to be able to get out there and get something critical and do something nuclear within the next few years. So we're targeting 2023 startup for Marvel. That's followed by the Department of Defense, which is also often a first adopter of new technologies. They've started a program called Project Pele, which were, where they're looking at micro reactors. So here again, we're talking about reactors that are maybe a few megawatts in size. So not like the, you know, the gigawatt type reactors that we have in the current fleet today, but they are built in a factory. They're transported to a site. They're very secure. The fuel is you know, one time fuel thing for the entire life of the reactor, which could be 15, 10, 15 years or so. And that's the vision for the, for the Department of Defense demonstration. They selected two companies. They're both working with INL on demonstrations. And we're looking for that in the 2023 to 24 range. We've also got a molten salt uh, experiment called McCree that's being done with Southern Company and Terra Power for the 2025 time range. That would go into the zipper cell for a demonstration. Whereas the Pele things would be going into the dome cell and farther out, we're working with other companies on things such as uh, high temperature gas reactors, uh, heat pipe type reactors, and, um, and also molten salt, other salt reactors. Uh, in the later part of the decade, uh, recently the natrium reactor from TerraPower, they announced they were going to build that in Wyoming at the site of a current coal plant. And so that's pretty exciting. We're going to be working hopefully more closely with the state of Wyoming on that demonstration. Natrium is a fast spectrum um, sodium reactor, and it is uh, going to be coupled with a on-site storage capability. So of course, energy storage is the other big thing that we have to solve in this area. And then finally, out there in 2029, we, we Idaho, the site will be hosting the UAMP small modular reactor built by NuScale, which is a light water reactor, a modular light water reactor. So, so we have an incredibly ambitious set of uh, reactor things that we're trying to do. And we realize that you know, not all of them may, you know, some of them probably won't happen, but we have pretty high confidence that some of them will. And so we're really looking forward to getting some of these new technologies and these new, uh, reactor concepts demonstrated on our site. So let's talk a little bit about Marvel since that is a INL specific program. It is a DOE project. Oh, it's 100 kilowatt thermal, sorry, not 200. My bad. Micro reactor to uh, look at eight R&D, basically. We're going to be looking at it with in terms of microgrid integration and providing remote heat and a very rapid development timeline. We just started this a little over a year ago. So it's a very, very fast uh, development program. And here's some more of the details about it. 100 kilowatt thermal with a 20 kilowatt of electric. That's where I got two from. And uh, with producing these heat parameters that you see here, and we'd be using a modified tree of fuel, which is, you know, well, it's going to be um, custom made of INL, but it's going to be essentially a modified tree of fuel with with great safety characteristics and essentially uh, modeled on the SNAP core geometry that was developed decades ago and uses four Stirling en engines uh, for, the, for the production. So it's, an, it's a very interesting design. I've seen them, the uh, a mock up of the, of the external part, and I've actually seen one of the Stirling engines that has been delivered to INL, so we're, we're moving right along with it. We're going to put it into a vacant area at the treat reactor. So we've, we've got this whole thing scoped out and we're working real hard on it. And it's going to be very exciting when it, when it gets, um, gets going. 
We do a lot of other nuclear things at INL as well. In addition to the, to the new reactors, we're working on software for control room operator efficiency. So with a big human simulation laboratory there where we look at how humans interact with control rooms. We can uh, you know, use software to create a control room in the, in the fleet. So that's another area of big human factors group at INL. We're working on new materials. This alloy 617 was the first material added to the um, boiler pressure and vessel code of ASME for the in 30 years for nuclear applications that happened last year. So very proud of that. And of course, we also work on, on space nuclear. So the every the Mars Perseverance rover, which is currently on Mars, has a radioisotope thermal generator in it that was built and assembled at IML, and then uh, our people went down to Florida during COVID and put it onto the rocket, and uh, away they went, and it's working very well. We also did that for Pluto New Horizons, and we're now currently working on a RTG for the Titan Dragonfly mission to be later to study. So that's what we're, I think that was my last slide on nuclear. So let's, oops, yeah. No, it's not. Here's one more. Here's the infrastructure part. We're part of a versatile test reactor program, which is a fast spectrum to provide fast spectrum test capabilities for nuclear energy. Uh, and that would be cited at INO. Currently in the fiscal 22 budget for the Department of Energy, <coughs> the BTR is not funded. So we have to we will wait and see what happens with that. We are subject, of course, to appropriations from the, from the government, but that would be an important part, an important infrastructure element for us. We have the, we already talked about the two NREC uh, demonstration cells. We also are building currently a sample prep lab for that will fill the, ga the gaps that we still have in our post radiation examination capability. The steel is all up for that. Uh, we are also looking at how are we going to sustain our thermal spectrum radiation capabilities for the future uh, at this advanced test reactor. Do we need to refurbish the ATR, which was built in 1967, by the way, and or are we going to need to build a new one? So that's currently under development with the Department of Energy and the Navy in terms of what the path forward will be for that. And then the final thing on this slide shows our uh, MOOSE codes, which are, and I don't remember what MOOSE stands for, I'm sorry, but it's a, it's a computational framework where you can attach various um, you know, algorithms to it. It's very flexible. It's used for a variety of things, including simulating nuclear reactor, but, but you can also simulate uh, groundwater flow through the subsurface if you want. We do have a, a module that does that as well. So we're, these are the supporting things that are supporting the, um, you know, the other projects as we move forward to trying to advance nuclear for the rest of the, you know, to have its part in the nation's energy mix. Of course, that's the reactor part. We also have to have the fuel cycle. So, the fuel cycle starts before you put it into the reactor, and then you need to worry about what's happening at the end. So you've got the fuel going in and the fuel coming out. So we look at management of legacy fuels, uh, proliferation risk reduction, and the like. And one of the things that's interesting about these new reactors that are being proposed is that they typically are not light water reactors, so they typically don't use light water reactor fuel, which has an enrichment of U-235 of 3 to 5%. Most of these new reactor concepts require something called HALU, or high assay low and enriched uranium, which ranges up to about 20% enrichment. But we don't have the enrichment capabilities in the US to do that right now. So why, while we are working on redeveloping those, INL is actually taking two approaches to produce uh, a, a basic feed stock of HALU available for these industrial new, uh, developers. We have two, one is uh, where we are down blending our EBR2 uh, spent fuel, which is all kinds of enriched uranium in it. And so we are separating out the other stuff and creating HALU, uh, you know, ingots basically that we can use for feedstock for the, for the 
fuels for these reactors. The other thing we're doing is called Zersex, where we're able to take off cladding, either aluminum or uh, zirconium cladding that is on the, the spent existing fuel, and then uh, down blend that in the remainder to the 20% enrichment and then use for that for the feedstock. So the idea here is that our national laboratory um, capabilities are being used to take existing resources. So you think about the old EBR2 fuel is actually, think, some people would think about it as waste, but really we're going to be using it now to create new fuels for future, for future reactors. So that's one thing we're doing with our fuel cycle activities. Another thing that we're doing here is we have, this has more to do with the uh, non-proliferation and aspects of it, but we have some, some facilities that simulate or duplicate the <coughs> things you can do in reprocessing. So Moran here is basically does a Purex process with uranium. You're building complementary capabilities in something we're calling bare tooth, which is we'll use plutonium. And finally, we've got also a, a glove box line that we're developing. They're calling it mystic molten salt thermophysical examination capability because molten salt reactors are of, of great interest. And so we're going to be able to study better the thermophysical properties of the molten salt in that capability. So those are some of the things we're doing there. Okay, so we've got all that nuclear stuff going on. How are we going to use it? Well, now we get on to the energy, transforming the energy paradigm, which I suspect many of you have thought about quite a bit. Right now, in nuclear, we're using it solely to produce electrons, right? We've also got other ways to produce electrons. You can, you know, coal, natural gas, and renewables. But what should the new system look like? And this is what we're trying to look at look at at INL and at other national laboratories as well and, and many other places. So the basic concept is pretty simple. I think the, you know, the doubles in the details, of course, but you take your nuclear energy and you can use it both for producing electrons, but also for producing heat. You've got your other generation technologies that can include renewables, could include natural gas with sequestration, it could include municipal waste generation, biomass concepts. And then you put them all together, not just with, to produce electricity, produce heat, to, to create all, all what you need, your electricity, your industrial uses, creating ammonia, for example, creating hydrogen, desalinating water, uh, creating biofuels. So this is all conceptually great. And then the question is, how do you actually do that, right? Because but what we're really interested in at INL is primarily in the nuclear part and primarily in the thermal part. How do we create thermal, useful thermal from nuclear to, for example, create hydrogen for the future economy? So we're working on this collaboratively with other laboratories and with uh, the government. Of course, the Department of Energy, even previous to its hydrogen earth shot, which you have heard about, announced recently, had a H2 at scale program where they were talking, creating multi-laboratory consortium to uh, make progress on the hydrogen economy, hydrogen for both fuel as a fuel carrier, but also potentially for large scale storage. And we're working with, IML is working with NETL, the National Energy Technology Laboratory on uses for you know, combining nuclear with spinning natural gas terminals, for example, and it's working closely with NREL also, the National Renewable Energy Technology. In fact, we have a program we're calling TriLab for the three applied energy laboratories focused directly on this whole integrated energy systems story. At INL, we have created a laboratory in one of our high bay facilities where we put many of the different integrated energy systems components together in one room. We have created a magnet, we call it a micro reactor agile non nuclear test bed. So it's to emulate a nuclear reactor heat source, but it's not nuclear, it's electric. But this is, this is in a lab, right? We've got a thermal energy distribution system 
We're working on high temperature electrolysis at INL. NREL is leading the efforts on low temperature electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And, the, and then we can, we can couple that with our power emulation laboratories and our real-time grid simulation cap, cap, capabilities to understand how this would all fit together. But the same thing, we can couple that with our human system simulation lab, which you saw a picture of earlier. And we're also working on batteries, battery technologies, solid oxide fuel cells, wireless charging, and just a whole array of things uh, that we can work towards uh, producing the integrated energy systems of the future. And so we're um, really, this, a lot of this stuff is really new in terms of, I believe, Magnet has just been installed this year. So we are really looking forward to getting, uh, taking, going from the modeling into this type of a scale in terms of working with how we integrate these systems together. We're also working with companies on demonstrating uh, particularly hydrogen production uh, using public and private partnerships. And so we have partnerships with Energy Harbor, which provides the work uh, runs the davis Bessie plant in Ohio. To, these are low temperature electrolysis uh, experiments where we use nuclear to create hydrogen. We're also working, I believe it's uh, with Exelon on Nine Mile Point. I believe it's the place that we believe is going to be the first production of uh, hydrogen using an existing nuclear plant. And we have plans to be working with Arizona Public Service in the near future as well. So we're doing these full scale demos out in the industry to work on nuclear hydrogen and thermal uses for, for nuclear. We are also working on other types of uh, clean energy solutions, biomass handling, uh, microgrids, uh, solid oxide fuel cells, and we're even trying to work on um, fast charging for bus fleets as well. So a wide variety of different types of things. <laughs> Moving on to the manufacturing, one of the interesting things we're doing at INO is it's in the area of what we call spark plasma sintering or electric field assisted, assisted sintering. So this is a very high current uh, technique, which we have scaled up. We've, we have acquired or you know had designed and installed the largest uh, spark plasma sintering machine in the world, which is currently just about done. It's not quite operational yet. The idea is to be able to quickly make very large uh, centered materials that will work at extreme environments, such as in nuclear plants, and uh, be able to use that to support uh, this, this new integrated energy systems environment. At the same time, of course, we're also working on securing the nation's infrastructure in, uh, in, in the new system, we're working on securing wireless because, as you know, wireless is that's what we do, right? But we have to, how do you keep 5G secure? We have actually have a wireless security institute at IEL where we can, we, we are working on various techniques and, and can do again uh, large scale demonstrations. I think this is one of the top one of the buttes that's near on our near our site, uh, showing some of the equipment up there, but we have a separate wireless test bed that we can do full scale testing at. And then also we have our partners in a manufacturing, cybersecurity for manufacturing <laughs> initiative and institute that the Department of Energy started about a year and a half ago. So we're working with a large number of uh, other national laboratories and universities on that as well. We have developed quite a few different tools and we have test beds as well on enhancing grid resilience and protecting in, in critical infrastructure. We've developed a software tool looking at all hazards analysis, and we provide a lot of uh, first responder training as well. But I want to show the test beds on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, one of them is called Citric. It's the only multi-scale critical infrastructure test bed in the, in the nation. And we also have a water security test bed that we do. So there, I think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, increased partnering in this area in terms of critical infrastructure uh, testing. And so if you have interest in that, let me know. Uh, finally, we're certainly uh, continuing to work on 
uh, other programs, one of them for critical infrastructure protection, and one of them we call Consequence Driven Cyber Informed Engineering, or CCE. It's a methodology that we've developed to try to build in the cybersecurity as we're engineering the, the equipment that we're using for control systems. So primarily, I, INL works in industrial control systems, cybersecurity. So it's not the IT you're thinking about necessarily with regards to you interacting with a computer system or a business systems. These are things that run the power grid, for example, and other industrial uh, applications and keeping them safe and secure. So that's really a whirlwind tour of what we, what some of the things we're doing at INL in terms of nuclear technologies, our activities in helping to develop that integrated energy system for the future, and how we support it with our advanced materials manufacturing, and also some of our security <laughs> systems that ensure that system remains, uh, remains safe and secure for the nation. So with that, I will end my presentation. I really appreciate your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions if we have any questions.